Okay, we've reached the last section of chapter 2, and this is on 2.7 on inverse functions. So the idea of an inverse function, functions are related to each other if they're inverse as if they undo each other. So one function may have addition, that means its inverse would have subtraction. There are a lot of opposite inverse relationships. Um, one way that this happens, or one relationship, important relationship with functions that are inverses, is that their domain and ranges are swapped. Literally, if you reverse the domain and range for two functions, they'll, you'll get their inverses. This new function we get, of course, then is called the inverse. Algebraically, the definition, this is an important definition, we could say if the two functions are f and g, so I'm going to use those to demonstrate, if we did f composition g of x, so the composition we were doing in 2.6, if we did f composition g, and when we simplified it, we got x. And then likewise, if we did g composition f, when we simplify it, we get x. Then that tells you the two functions are inverses of each other. It's not enough that they be the same, but they have to both undo each other down to just x. So the domain and range values, like we said, are all swapped for these. An important notation that tells you're dealing with inverses. So if f is the original function, now we may call them f and g, that's okay too, but you may also see this notation. If f is the original function, this inverse notation, it looks like f, the little negative 1 in the exponent of x, that would be your inverse. So take a look at this, this example here. If f of x, we've got a table of values, so your x values are in the first row. Your y values are in the second row. If, that's, if those are points on f of x, then points on the inverse. Remember, the domain and range are swapped. So what do you notice about the points on this table compared to the points on this table? Hopefully you see that the x and y values are all reversed or swapped, and that's an important characteristic of inverse functions. So if you were asked to show that two functions are inverses of each other, we're going to apply that definition and see that it holds up. So we're going to do f composition g of x and g composition f of x and see what happens. So let's start with f composition g of x. So f is the outer function. f is 5x. So remember we do compositions. Whatever the outer function is, wherever there's an x, I replace it with parentheses. And then what goes inside of those parentheses? That's going to be the inside function, which was g of x x divided by 5. Those 5's would cancel out and just leave me with x. Try this on your paper. Go the other direction. Try doing g of f of x, so where g is now the outer function, and see what you end up with. So if g is the outer function, g is x divided by 5, I'm going to replace that x with parentheses, so I've got parentheses over 5. Then inside the parentheses is the inside function now, which is f of x, which was 5x. Those 5's would cancel out and just leave you with x. So you notice when we did f composition g and g composition f, they both left us with x. That shows that they're inverses of each other. Try this one. We've got f of x equals 2x cubed minus 1, and g of x equals the cube root of x plus 1 over 2. So I'm going to start with f of g of x. Make sure you see all the pieces here. f is the outer function, so I've got 2 parentheses cubed minus 1. Inside the parentheses, I put g of x, the inner function. Now what happens when you cube a cube root? The radical goes away, and you're just left with what's under the radical. Think algebraically what would happen here. Those 2's will cancel out and I'm left with x plus 1 in the numerator, minus the one that was on the outside. Now the 1's cancel out, and I'm left with x. That's a good sign. f composition g gave me x, but it's got to work in both directions, so let's do g composition f. So g is now the outer function, so I've got cube root of parentheses plus 1 over 2. Inside the parentheses is the f of x function. So this numerator needs to be simplified first, so if I drop the parentheses, you'll see that the 1's cancel. Now the 2's will divide out, and I'm left with the cube root of, cube of x to the third 
which just leaves me with x. So since f composition g and g composition f both gave you x, that proves that they're inverses of each other. If either one did not give you x, you could stop. It has to work in both directions. So as soon as it doesn't work in one direction, then they're not inverses. But if it says verify, then it should work in both directions. An important property of inverse functions is that the reflective over the line y equals x, think back to when we did linear functions, how would the line y equals x look when you graph it? It would have a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So the line y equals x would just be the diagonal line here in black through the origin. Oops. So here's two functions. I didn't give you the names of these functions, but the one in red is an inverse of the one in blue. So if you t imagine flipping either one over that black line, they would be a reflection of each other. That's a property of inverses. So you may see some questions in the homework where they give you a graph of two functions and ask you if they're inverses. Here's a graph from a graphing calculator. It's a little hard to tell all the time if they are reflective over that line y equals x. Uh, so one good way to, to test this out is to find points on each graph and see that if you reversed them, flopped, you know, flip-flopped the x and the y, would that opposite point or that reciprocal point appear on the other graph? So here's what I mean. Take a look at, let's say, this function right here. Notice that it has a y-intercept at negative 1. So this contains the point 0, negative 1. So its inverse function then would need to contain the point negative 1, 0. Does it? Well, negative 1, 0 would be over here. So it looks like the other graph contains that point. Try it for something else. Let's say, go back to this first function, this first graph. Let's say we look at the x-intercept. Looks like it's about 1, 0. So that means the reciprocal, I'm sorry, the inverse function, reciprocal something else, the inverse function would have to contain the point 0, 1. Does it? And yes, it is. It's right there. So I think it's safe to say that these two functions are inverses. All right, so finding an inverse. So these are important steps. You're going to want to know these steps. Um, if you do a few of them, I think you'll have the steps down. They're not hard to remember, but make sure you know these. Step one is to replace f of x with a y. It's always easier to work with it as a y instead of an f of x. Step two, interchange or swap the x and the y. Step three, take your new equation and solve for y. And that's going to be your inverse function. Last step is to replace that y with the f inverse notation, f inverse of x. This last line here, it says we can verify it by showing that if we do the composition f of f inverse and f inverse of f, that they both simplify to x. Let's do an example. This isn't as complicated as it sounds. So let's say we want to find the inverse for this function. f of x equals 7x minus 5. So what was step 1? Replace the f of x with a y. Step 2 was to interchange the x and the y. Literally, you're going to swap their positions. So if we have y and x like so, swap them, we get x equals 7y minus 5. Now take your new equation and solve for the y. So I'm going to add 5 to the other side. Divide by 7. That's my inverse function. Last step is to replace the y with the inverse notation. So that y I change to f inverse of x. Okay, give this one a try. Maybe pause the video, see how you do. We've got f of x equals x cubed plus 1. So step 1, we're going to replace f of x with a y. Step 2, we're going to swap the x and the y. Step 3, we're going to solve for y. And then we need to, so I subtracted 1, and then to get the y by itself, I need to take the cube root. Remember, with radicals, you can't separate when there's an adding or subtracting sign, so it's just the cube root of x minus 1 equals y. And then replace y with the f inverse notation. Uh, to check to see if a function has an inverse by looking at its graph, there's a very important test we can use to do this, and it's called the horizontal line test works similar to the vertical line test. Remember the vertical line test earlier in the chapter was to check to see if you're looking at a function.
the horizontal line test tells you that if you the function that you are looking at has an inverse not all functions have inverse they have to be what's called one to one to have an inverse and the definition of a one to one function is that every output can only correspond to one input I'm not going to spend a lot of time harping on this definition you don't have to necessarily know it although the term one to one means that a function has an inverse. You should be familiar with that. But what I want you to remember is that to check these, we can use the horizontal line test. So to see if a function passes this definition, is one to one, we're going to use the horizontal line test. So like I said, it works very similar to the vertical line test. If you draw a horizontal line through the graph, if it intersects the graph at more than one point, then it does not have an inverse. Let's take a look. So we've got a function, it's a parabola. Think about if you were to draw a horizontal line somewhere through this graph, anywhere, would it pass the horizontal line test? And the answer is no, it would not, because the horizontal line would intersect at more than one point. So while this may be a function, it does not have an inverse.